CNT 125, Chapter 9. Uh, we're on the section of the chapter on WAN connectivity. Familiarity, familiarity is the key in this part of the chapter. Reason being, a lot of WAN connections will already be in place at companies or customer sites that you go to work at. So at least being familiar with what they're using is helpful from day one. As time goes on, you can be learning the connections, the, the technologies are implementing, exploring, etc. So with that in mind, familiarity is key. Let's take a look. Broadband, uh, general broadband, well suited for residential customers, even some business uh, business sites. Um, with this one, ISP is going to make best effort for the bandwidth that is advertised up to that bandwidth. Um, in many cases, the bandwidth is asymmetrical, uh, meaning download would be faster than upload, which again for most, most of us at home is fine. Most small businesses, that's fine. Uh, for higher premium, business can get a little bit faster broadband band and possibly even some static IP addresses for their package. So this works well for residential and maybe small business kinds of things. The dedicated internet access, this is now where we start getting into business connections because we get allocated bandwidth. If they're saying they're giving us, you know, blah bandwidth, that's what they're that's what you're gonna get. Not up to, that's what you're gonna get. And usually with that is some sort of service level agreement. Um, that service level agreement defines the bandwidth and um, recovery time and service time. How long would you it take to repair and bring this back online if the connection goes down? Typically bandwidth now is symmetrical, same down and same up. Um, so with that, we're also going to pay a lot more. Your company's going to pay a lot more for a dedicated internet access, but you're getting all those benefits with it. Uh, that's why a lot of people in homes are like, hey, I'm, I'm saying I'm getting blah bandwidth, but I'm only getting part of that. That's because the ISP is doing the best, eff best effort to get you that bandwidth, but it's not carved in stone. With a dedicated internet access with a service level agreement, if you're paying for blah bandwidth, that's what you should be getting. That's the agreement you made with the provider. All right, so when we start talking about some of the first technologies, some of our first technologies sit on the public switch telephone network, the plain old, tele plain old telephone system. Um, this is this is the traditional analog phone network that a lot of our technology sat on to begin with. Um, so real quickly, just keeping in mind, you know, uh, a lot of companies and homes would use analog connections to connect in or connect to sites. That's how a lot of things got started. So a couple terms that get thrown around that you should at least be familiar with is the central office. This is where the telephone company equipment was and the switches they used to move data from you know your house to somebody else's house and process those phone calls. Uh, the local looper last mile, that's the, the piece coming to a person's house or residence. Uh, and the network interface unit, we mentioned that before, that is the DMARC point at, at basically the site. So if I take a look here, this was the phone company, the switching office. They might have a remote switching facility out in a neighborhood that would service, you know, uh, all the people on that street, if you will, or all the people in that cul-de-sac. Um, phone line would go to the house, and the box on the side of the house was the DMARC point, where the phone company's equipment ended and your equipment began. Uh, this was all the basis for DSL, which is the, the first technology we're going to mention. This whole infrastructure was the basis for uh, DSL connection, digital subscriber line. This was introduced in the mid-90s, and for a lot of people, this was the stepping stone away from dial-up internet into first broadband internet. Um, this operated over the phone system. It was competing directly with cable broadband at the time, and it supported data and voice across that one cable, data and voice across that one cable. Um, it was limited in distance. The closer you were to the CO, the higher the throughput, the further away, the lower the throughput, or if you were too far away, you might not have been able to get DSL. Um, in my area, I was I used DSL for quite a while, um, but I knew I happened to be close to the CO, so I knew it was available. Um, it uses a modulation technique. Uh, your phone line only used bandwidth in the 300 to 3300 hertz range. All the frequencies above that were not used, so DSL was the technology to start using those unused frequencies up there. So what they did was, here was your phone line frequencies, that's where that data was, the upper frequencies they used for sending data upstream, if you will, 
and then the downloading data from the internet to your computer, you know, downstream, downloading web pages, etc., was used in even a higher frequency band. Um, so DSL was taking that one phone line and multiplexing together using frequency bands, uh, multiplexing together your phone data or phone information, your phone traffic, and your computer data, if you will, multiplexing those two together. Uh, the provider had a DSLAM. This is basically uh, um, a, a multiplexer at the site that would uh, take your two signals coming from your house and pull them back apart, want the phone to go to the phone uh, switching equipment and the data to go to the internet, if you will. Um, and it's your site, your DSL modem was combining the two, the phone and the computer together across that line. And what got to the phone company, it would pull those back apart, phone to the phone switching equipment, and then uh, the data out to the internet. That's what they were using. So it's your site, you would have a DSL, <coughs> excuse me, DSL modem as well as a splitter here. Uh, the splitter took the signal coming in, sent phone data to the phone. Uh, internet data to your modem, and then would modulate for your computer. Um, so here, this modem was taking my computer data and putting it into this upper frequency band. That's really what it was doing. That's what your DSL modem was doing. In your house, you needed these little filters on your phones. That was so um, the phone would not play this upper frequency data, if you will. It was kind of filtering the data out so only the voice traffic went to the phone. There was a couple varieties of DSL, uh, ADSL, SDSL, and VDSL. So real quickly, we'll look at those. ADSL was probably the most common for, for most people, asymmetric. Um, here you had a, a higher download speed than upload. The, again, this was most common for many people, and this worked well for movies, surfing, you know, web surfing, etc. Uh, even in my house, we, we streamed Netflix for quite a while on a DSL connection, on the early days of streaming DSL. Um, ADSL, ADSL 2 plus, um, here you had bandwidths in the 24 meg down, 3 meg up, which again in early days of streaming was more than adequate, uh, but I'm, I'm limited in distance too, uh, usually only, you know, 2 kilometers is like, you know, a mile and apart, if you will, a mile and a half kind of thing, um, to your, to your provider. So here's your phone traffic down here, here's your upstream, here's your downstream. Um, at your site, here was that splitter again, splitting the traffic between phone and uh, modem. If I look at this picture again, you see the splitter splitting out the phone to the um, uh, to the modem for data. Um, here's your VDSL. This was your very high bit or variable DSL, uh, 50, 52 meg down, 16 meg up. Uh, uh, still a little, it need to be a little bit closer than uh, ADSL. Um, and again, this would this was working for maybe businesses, especially if you were in a metropolitan area. And symmetric DSL equal down and up speeds around two megs uh, each direction. And this they give you a bunch of examples in the book of like a bank bank branch office needing to download information as well as upload information, maybe their accounts at the end of the day, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this one they actually used uh, many phone wires have four. Many phone cables had four wires in, only two were getting used. Um, the phone cable, in this case, all four wires would get used uh, for the symmetric DSL. As we moved into competitor cable broadband, in many areas you either had DSL or cable. Uh, I should say in, in, in areas you might have had only DSL offered or in other areas you might have only had cable offered. Um, so many people, when you ask about maybe the history of their connection, they're like, oh, we had cable. Maybe that was the only thing offered in their area. And same thing for DSL. I know in my area, initially, the only thing here was DSL. Uh, cable internet, a lot of people use this and or might still be using this in their area. Um, here, your, your DOCSIS data over cable service interface specification. Those are the specification standards over the years. Um, 70 meg down, 7 meg up. And your, your newest standard is in the 4, 4.0, DOCSIS 4.0. Uh, symmetric speeds of up to 10 down and uh, 10 gig down and 6 gig up. Okay, so the speeds have increased over time. To do this, your uh, 
your cable company infrastructure is in many cases a hybrid fiber coax cable network, if you will. Uh, so there's fiber out to a certain point and then coax cable to people's houses, the cable drop, if you will. So at the head end out to distribution hubs in, think of them maybe a hub in a whole entire development or, or building complex, if you will. Uh, the hub there, all, all connecting all those is fiber. And then fiber going out to a node. Again, this might be a box that's servicing uh, a cul-de-sac in your neighborhood. And then there would be coax cable going out to each of the individual houses in that cul-de-sac, if you will. That is typically the structure that your uh, cable providers are doing. This requires a cable uh, modem. Uh, many people had these and or still have these. These are operating at layer one and two. They really don't care about anything above that. Um, it's really, it really focused on getting the data um, out to the customer site and then IP traffic above that would be normal. Um, you might actually have the cable modem connect to another device like a router or might be combined with another device. Some people had variations of both of those. Again, cable modem is operating at layer one and two, everything above, IP and so forth, it doesn't really manipulate. Here is just a sample of a cable modem. There's the coax coming in and your network connection initially coming out going to one PC, but a lot of people now connect that into router for multiple people in your house. Again, this is your original hookup, coax into here, Ethernet out to a single PC, but a lot of people now um, have this where it's supporting both television and data. So you might have a splitter here. The splitter goes to your TV or set-top box, um, and the uh, other side of the splitter goes to the cable modem to your PC. Or, again, you might be uh, adding in a router here to multiple things in your house can connect, or adding in the wireless element, and your modem is servicing this pur purpose here. Cable or DSL coming in the house here into your router, fanning that connection out to all the devices in the house. Uh, the device itself might be combination. Uh, here, coax can come right into here, and it has the built-in switch and wireless into it. Some people have had those and or used those. Here shows the splitter going to that router and then a set-top box. Just giving you a jog in your memory on maybe a couple different connections you might have had. And this, this coax cable is typically serving a couple functions. Um, at least data and video for a lot of people, TV and uh, computer data. Some people still have phone on top, but some people just use their cell phone so they don't subscribe to that piece. Um, like DSL, cable broadband provides dedicated always up. You don't have to dial in like we used to with the old dial-up internet service. Um, with cable broadband, many subscribers will share a line in a neighborhood or an area. Um, I remember when my brother first got uh, broadband, it was cable in his area. Uh, he was one of the first people in his neighborhood. He's like, oh, the bandwidths are great. Along, you know, five five years down the road, he's like, hey, man, these bandwidths aren't great anymore. And it happened to be that they were building houses on his street. And as more people moved in the neighborhood and built houses and connected, that bandwidth was getting shared among the neighbors. Um, and that was something that was a, a realization for a lot of people over time. They didn't realize it was like that. But it has to do with that structure. It has to do with that structure that they're using. All right, we'll come back in the next podcast and continue on.